Uh, there's a Cherokee proverb uh, that actually describes the battle of two wolves within each of us. One is good and one is evil. And the question is asked, which one wins? And the answer to that is the one you feed. Now very often we kind of look at this and we, we give this attention and say this is a function of the brain. Um, but there's a lot of evidence coming out right now that suggests that it's not really a function of the brain as much as it's under the control and regulation of the gut. Now we've always known this. We've always paid attention to this. The gut has been giving us subliminal messages constantly. Okay, so it comes to a point where eventually we want to try to make sure that we pay attention to the wisdom of the gut. So you've heard things such as, listen to your gut, follow your gut feeling, time for a gut check, trust your gut instincts, you are what you eat. And it is interesting because we have this in all our sayings, and there's a lot more that I could uh, share with you as well. And one of my slides had that <laughs> a lot more for you to share. But it's all right, we'll work with without that. We're also reminded of the gut and the gut response as far as mental processing when we start to look at popular literature. And so my slide shows you that we have, in 1843, Charles Dickens wrote A Christmas Carol. And in the story, A Christmas Carol, Ebenezer Scrooge is visited by the first ghost, and the first ghost gives him an ominous warning. He says to him, why do you doubt your senses? And Scrooge kind of looks at him and fumbles a little bit, and then he says, a little thing affects them. Ah, you may be a piece of undigested beef. You could be a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of undone potato. There's more about gravy than grave about you, whatever you are. So it's really important now that we start to look at the gut and give it its full attention as a center of our universe, at the core of our existence. Now, we've always understood the gut and its role as far as digestion, but new research is coming out that really indicates now that the gut is responsible for a lot more things, more than just digestion, more than just health, but it's also responsible for our behavior, our moods, and our different kinds of emotions. And then early in our development, there's been several studies coming out from some of the top universities where they've looked at this in the developmental phase of, of animals. And what they have found is that the gut is already asserting its influence. It's already working to try to set up the structure that's important in order to make that gut and brain connection. Your gut has created its own personalized, individualized microbiome. And this is kind of a special micro microbial DNA colony, kind of like a fingerprint. Now this is important because you hear literature that out there about uh, different kinds of transplant, moving these, but remember, this is individualized to you, much like a fingerprint. Now, I wanna give you a warning, beware. These microbes outnumber us, okay? They outnumber us. We are more microbe than we are human. Our body is made up of about 10 trillion cells. The bacteria, have over 100 trillion cells. That's a, I should have said 10 trillion, 100 trillion, that's a one to 10 ratio. In other words, we make up, our microbiome makes up 90% of our existence. We contribute 10% to our cellular content. Our genome, it consists of about 30,000 genes. The bacteria express over 3 million, 101. So what you need to understand is basically, in essence, we are an active, dynamic petri culture dish for their survival. And our health and their survival is intimately linked. And keep that in mind. Now, when we start talking about medical interventions, we usually look at it as linear, cause and effect, symptom and cure. But in this case, when we start talking about the gut, it's more circular, it's more of a systemic, it's more holistic. It goes from that kind of paradigm. So what we have here is we have a stimulus that actually sets off a chain or cascade of events. It also creates numerous different kind of biochemical pathways. We have negative feedback loops and we have immune responses. Now, also with this regulation, we have, what we have is a gut-brain axis. 
And this butt gut brain axis is the main function or the main control of that is by the vagus nerve. But there have been recent studies that have actually cut the vagus nerve and found out that the gut is still communicating with the brain. So it's really important for us to understand that the gut is really has a lot of control. It is the only organ in the body that has its own nervous system. That's the enteric nervous system. And we're seeing a lot of how that has an effect. The gut also is able to produce and release neurotransmitters and chemical reactants that are released into the circulation and into the lymphatic system. This too has a way to actually interact with the brain, but all the organs in the body. I like to work off my slides, so I'm gonna work off this. So we can communicate and regulate not only to the brain, but other organs, and that's really important. Now, when you look at the gut, it has a discriminatory little layer of cells called the, the epithelial cells and this little uh, area surface. Okay, should I catch up? Let's catch up. There's our gut. There's our wolves. These are our sayings. <laughs> Charles Dickens, the gut in our universe, the gut, brain, axis, lymphatic system, enteric system. These are our microbes, how many of them in all, and, and that linear and approach. But right here, now we're here, here are those cells. These are the epithelial cells. They're also here in cartoon. And then this is that mucous little flora that's there. And these gap junctions, their job is to determine what is allowed to get in from the digestive system. So this is really important when we try to look at what is able to cross. Now some pathogens are able to sneak in here, change their identity, get in here, and they're basically subdued by these various different immune responses, but not always. Okay, I want to make sure that you understand, but not always. But our gut is constantly vigilant, trying to find out what is allowed in and what is not, what is tolerated and what is not. Now, all of this allows our gut to perform its various functions. Okay, one of the major functions that gut does is with hydration. So anything dealing with hydration, our body is 60 to 75 percent water. All cells and all cellular processes are actually occur within this aqueous solution. It also provides a fluid for a conduit fluid that's good for circulatory and lymphatic system. We all are aware that our gut is important for food, fuel, growth and development, and also oral medications. So when your gut's disrupted, the medications they may be getting to you may not be delivered at the way we think they are to be delivered. So it's really important that when we look at this, we too often try to look at how much am I eating and what I'm eating, and not as what is being absorbed. Additionally, our gut is responsible for immune response. 70% of all immune response comes from our gut. It determines what is good, what is bad, what is tolerant, what is intolerant, and what is protective. And it is when we have these immune intolerant responses that add to our diminished health, diseases, and allergenic reactions. Contributing factors that lead to your gut, these are things that may affect your gut, are diet, it can be long endurance and intense type work and exercise, it can be stress, and it can be sleep disturbances where you're not getting enough sleep. And this is interesting because this is also one of those symptoms of a gut dysfunction. Additionally, the antibiotics that we take as well as this new awareness we have on cleanliness has decreased that microbiota. So we have become less tolerant and less able to handle some of the challenges the gut get. Recently, there's been research done by Auburn. This was done by the School of Kinesiology and Vet Med in collaboration. And what we looked at was we looked at the effect of environmental heat on gut function. So we exposed animals, rats, to a 45 minute exposure of hot heat. And when we did that, what we found was that the gut actually decreased the microvilla, those little fingertips that we showed, by about a third. Imagine what decreasing the gut by one third of the villi has effect on gut function, and that's growth, development, hydration, immune response, uh, yada, 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 all the way down the line. So it has a tremendous effect on it. Now when we gave some of the rats probiotics prior to the intervention, that situation was ameliorated. Now this is just one example of some of the gut research that's possible. There's a lot of other areas to explore. So I'd like to tell you there are two wolves inside each of us. One good or one bad. But I'd like to speak of it as a microbial 
it is more like one tolerant and one intolerant. Which wolf wins? The one we feed. So, there's a book written by H.G. Wells talking about the War of the Worlds. And in it, an alien species lands here. Now, we don't defeat them because we're smarter. We don't defeat them because we're better technology. And we don't outnumber them. They are defeated because they are inability and intolerance to handle the bacteria. Well, we may have a current day war of the worlds. Beware. They're already here. They're in us. They outnumber us. So if we do have a battle, the battle that we have right now is with our gut and microbiome. The same ones that deal with our health, our behavior, our development, and individuals, make us as individuals. Our life depends on exist their existence, coexistence, and our tolerance. And therefore, I leave you with follow your gut. Thank you very much.